Well, good morning, everyone. You may be seated. How's everybody doing today? You guys are doing good? Good. Well, you're looking good today. Everybody cleans up nice. <laughs> well, almost everybody anyways. All right. Yeah. I'm just teasing. So how many of you guys made it out to the car wash yesterday? Oh, lots of hands. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming out and supporting the youth yesterday at the car wash. Um, it was a lot of fun and um, uh, it was a great success. And so Really thankful for O'Reilly Auto Parts there in San Jacinto for opening up their business for us to do that. Um, yeah. And David Garcia, who works there, um, he arranged for all of that to take place. And uh, he and Sabrina were a big part of that. And of course, Daniel, um, our youth pastor. So just it was a great day. And just thanks for coming and supporting our kiddos. Um, a couple of announcements that I want to mention that you saw earlier. Um, Sunday on June 5th, which, by the way, a Christianity 101 starts on Sunday, June 5th, not Sunday, June 6th, because there is no Sunday, June 6th this year. Um, it's on the 5th. And so, um, but we are having a promotion Sunday that day. So uh, we'll be celebrating graduates uh, on that Sunday. And our kiddos who are moving up to their new grades will be doing that on Sunday, June 5th. And so we're also having a special baptism service. And I want to say this to you. If you have committed your life to Christ, if you've come to, um, to know him personally and you have not been baptized, this is your opportunity to come and to follow through in obedience to your decision to, to follow Jesus in baptism, okay? And so we're going to be having a special baptism service Sunday, June 5th. It's going to be over at the Mitchell's house. They live not, not even a mile from here, um, and they've got a beautiful backyard. The pool is heated, by the way. So even if it's a cool day, we will survive this. It'll be a great day, okay? Um, and you, know, you won't turn into a popsicle, I promise, all right? But, uh, but what a wonderful time, right, for us to just say, Lord, I'm all in. I'm all in. I want to give my life to you, and I want to obey you in this act of baptism. So um, come and see me if you're interested in that. Uh, you can talk to myself or just call the office in the coming weeks, and we'll give you all the details. And lastly, I want to say this. I'm super excited. Father's Day is around the corner, okay? Um, I'm approaching my one-year anniversary here at the church, uh, which I'm really excited about. And, and I don't know how many of you were here last June for Father's Day for our Reawaken Sunday. How many of you guys were here for that? Wasn't that a great Sunday? Well, we're going to do it again. We're doing it a little, a slightly different. Our theme is different, but we still are going to have a we're going to have a car show, so if you have a car, if you have a nice car and you want to bring that car out, we'd love to feature your car in our car show. We are going to have trophies this year, you guys, so we're going to be giving away some trophies for various cars uh, that come, and so we just want to have some really amazing cars. We're going to have some food trucks. There'll be food afterwards. Uh, it's just going to be a great time to hang out and celebrate. Uh, the theme this year is Every Man a Hero, and uh, I'm going to be interviewing uh, on stage here, Ian Weeks. Ian is the worship leader over at Community Christian, uh, John Scott's church just down the street. Ian is running for state assembly here in California. He's, he's one, of the, one of our valley residents. He's just a typical guy that said, hey, I want to do something great. And so he's running for state assembly. Ian will be here as well as Pastor Brian Hawkins, uh, who is running for Congress. Um, he'll be here joining us, um, and we're going to be pulling up some other guys from our congregation. We're going to have a panel of, of uh, some heroes from the community and some heroes from our own body here. Um, we're going to be talking to them and asking them questions about their lives and exploring what God has done in their lives. Anyways, it's going to be a wonderful time. You're going to want to be here. Invite the men in your life out. Guys, you don't want to miss this. It's just going to be a great Sunday. So Father's Day, June 19th. Every man a hero. Super excited about that. Um, so, you know, they all, they, people say that sports arenas are always super windy. Does, does anybody know why? Because they're full of fans. You know, so, yeah, no, it's true. They are. And so, anyways, no. How many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? Anybody want to guess? Ten tickles. Yeah. Yeah, let that sink in for a minute, all right? Why, you know, why did they call the Dark Ages the Dark Ages? Anybody know? Because there were so many nights. I mean, think about it. There, there was a lot of nights. 
How, or, or let me, let, what about this? What did the big flower say to the little flower? He said, hi, bud. Yeah, see, that was a good one. Uh, what about this? What's sticky and brown? Oh, you guys are thinking some bad things right now, aren't you? A stick, you guys. I mean, it's a stick, okay? Come on, you guys, don't let your minds go to that place, you guys. Come on. Listen, last week, we were on the subject. You know, we're walking through the book of Revelation together. This has been an exciting journey. It's been an exciting journey for me. Last week, we were, we were in chapter 14 at those beginning verses there. This is an interlude, by the way, in the middle of as John is describing the judgments of God during this great tribulation. We find ourselves in, the, in this interlude period where John is describing some various events that take place during the Great Tribulation. And we saw last week that John described the 144,000, those Jewish Billy Grahams, if you will, um, singing a worship song to God. They had been given a song unique to themselves, and they were praising God. And we talked about this idea of worship. We saw this great worship scene unfold. The title of the message last week was Worship in the Chaos, and I can tell you that we are experiencing on some levels, I don't know if you've noticed, but some chaos in our world. It's a little crazy out there, okay? But there is an opportunity for us in the chaos to worship, and we talked about how worship can bring joy in the chaos. We talked about how worship can bring hope in the chaos. We talked about how worship can bring peace in the chaos, and how worship can bring victory into your lives in the middle of the chaos. And so there's an opportunity for us, no matter where we find ourselves in life, no matter what challenges lay ahead or what challenges we're facing now, we can experience all the blessings of God's kingdom simply by worshiping Him, by committing ourselves to Him, and by coming into His presence. We're going to see a phrase here this morning as we continue reading through Revelation 14. It's, I tried to encapsulate, encapsulate this phrase in the title of the message. It's there in verse 6, as John continues describing this scene that unfolds there um, during the Great Tribulation as he's witnessing these future events. And the phrase there is the eternal gospel. In fact, we're going to read this together. Let's, let's do that. If you have your Bibles, really encourage you to get them out. If you have a Bible app, open it up, okay? Let's read this. This is Revelation chapter 14. I'm going to begin reading in verse 6, and I'm just going to read through verse 13, okay? So let's read this together. And, and I'm going to pause a few times and talk about some things. There's a scene that you're, we're going to read here that unfolds that is quite concerning, okay? It's, it's pretty vivid in its description, but, but let's read this. So John says, then I saw another angel. By the way, when he says another angel, you remember there were seven angels that blew seven trumpets. You remember that? Okay, this is another angel, this isn't that ang those angels. So he says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the, here's that phrase, and by the way, I think this is the only time in the Gospels that this phrase, and in the New Testament, in the whole Bible, I think, actually, that this phrase is mentioned, the eternal gospel. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But he says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and the springs of water. And then there's a second angel. A second angel followed and said, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. We're going to talk about that in a minute which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. And now a third angel. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, you remember the mark we talked about. What is the mark? It's a, it's a number that is described there. It's 666. It's the number of man, as John says, there as he's writing about it. So these who have received the mark, he says in verse 10, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup, the cup of his wrath. By the way, why does he say full strength? Well, there was a practice back in the day 
to take your wine and to mix it with water, okay? Because it goes a little farther that way, right? It dilutes it a little. You can, it'll last longer, okay? Well, this is not diluted, okay? This wine, the, the wrath of God's fury is not diluted. It's coming in full force. And so he says, he says, they too will drink the wine of God, God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath, they will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. But let me just pause there for a second. What John is witnessing here is just in simplest terms, hell. This is what he sees. He sees a picture of hell. Now, some people would say to me, Chris, look, what is he saying here? Is he saying that people who go to hell are going to suffer forever and ever? How is it possible that a loving God would send people to hell to suffer forever and ever? And my simple answer is, listen, I'm reading the same words that you're reading. It's very plain and clear here in the scriptures. Number one, hell does exist. It is a real place. And is it designed to be an eternal place where those who go there are punished, if you will, that they are, they are subjected to this wrath, this punishment of God for eternity? Well, the simple answer is yes. That, that's the way I read it. And that, that, should, that should frighten and concern every person, by the way. It is, this is not a light subject. This is not a light issue that we should just pass over and say, well, that, okay, whatever. It's just myth and, and fantasy. This isn't real. Well, I think what John is describing is a real place. Now, it's interesting that the only ones who witness the, the eternal punishment here of those who have rejected God are the Lamb and who? And the angels. You know, he doesn't say that the redeemed or the church witnesses this, which I think is a picture of God's grace in our lives. Look, I don't think heaven would be heaven for us if we were aware of the eternal suffering of those who rejected God. Nevertheless, we have an opportunity right now to tell people that God loves them and to help them find a way out of this, uh, this place. No one is destined to go there. Everyone has a choice and can avoid hell. And so he says there in verse 11, And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Now you remember the beast and the image. The beast being the Antichrist, and the image was erected, created. There was this image that was put into the temple, and it's going to happen in the future. There, the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. There will be an image that's placed there that the whole world will be called to bow down and worship. By the way, isn't it interesting that it's all about worship? It's all about worship. It's all about who you devote yourself to, who you value, who you bow a knee to. Who do you submit to? It's all about worship. And when the Antichrist rises to power, that's what the issue is for him. He says, no, you must worship me. Worship my image. Reject God the creator. Worship me. And so he says, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Some people are afraid, by the way, some Christians are afraid that they will inadvertently get the mark of the beast. There was this, this message that was floated out there by, by a bunch of people who I think were kind of lunatics, crazy, interpreting Scripture the wrong way, saying that the COVID-19 vaccine was the mark of the beast. Okay? Listen, that's not true. You're not going to accidentally or inadvertently get the mark of the beast. It won't happen that way. It's going to be very clear the decision that you make, and it will require a devotion to 
the Antichrist. You will be bowing a knee, committing your life, subjecting yourself to him and to his rule and to his ideologies. This is not something that someone will accidentally stumble into. So you don't need to worry that someday you're going to wake up and you're going to have accidentally taken the mark of the beast. It won't happen like that. But those who do take that mark, those who have said, yes, I will bow a knee to you, I will worship you, I will follow you, they are destined for this place of eternal punishment. And he says there in verse 12, he says, This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. By the way, the lamb that we're reading about is Jesus. Here his name is mentioned. Who remain faithful to Jesus. And then he says, then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this. You should underline this, by the way. God told John to make sure you write this. He says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Who is he speaking about? Well, he's speaking about the people who during this great tribulation refuse to bow down to the image of the beast. Those who refuse to take the mark. He says, blessed are they, um, those who refuse to, that who die in the Lord from now on. He says, yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. You know, I was thinking about this idea of their deeds following them. What in the world does that mean? Someone I was reading about said, you know, it's like if you tie a, you know, a, a can to the tail of a dog, right? Everywhere he goes, that can is going to bounce around and follow him. There's another word picture of this in Scripture. Do you remember after Jesus had risen from the dead and he was there on the Sea of Galilee and his disciples were fishing in the boat and he said to them, um, he said, hey, why don't you guys try throwing your net on the other side? And they didn't know who this fellow was on the shore. What is this guy talking about? We've been fishing all night here. The Bible says that Jesus had been there on the shore. He had had prepared a fire. He was waiting for their, their arrival and he shouts out to them, hey guys, you haven't had any luck. Throw your net on the other side of the boat. And so they do. And you know the story. They, they, they catch, they haul in or try to haul in this catch that is too big for the boat. It's going to overwhelm the boat. And somebody in the boat does something amazing. He jumps out of the boat. Peter, when he recognizes it's Jesus, and he leaves all the blessing behind him. And he barrels straight towards the shore to where Jesus is at. And when he arrives on the shore, guess what follows behind him? The blessing. All of the fish, all of the things that were caught, they follow behind him. It's a word picture, I think, of what's being described here. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. It's almost like an investment in the future. It's like I'm doing this so that I can be blessed later. God has a blessing for all of us. And sometimes we don't see that blessing in this life. Sometimes we struggle. We're like, well, Lord, where are you? How come I don't see you in the midst of my circumstances? And God is telling us, he's promising us, he says, listen, the blessing is building up behind you. It will follow you. It's almost like I described it, you know, I described sort of the events politically in our world as like a wave crashing over our heads. It's the same concept. Here we find ourselves at the shore and the wave of blessing begins to crash over us. What a wonderful picture. Their deeds will follow them. The first point, really, that I want to sort of emphasize today with you is this, is that God will always provide a way out. Now listen, not everybody takes the way. Not everybody will accept it. But God, in His graciousness, in His mercy, always provides a way out. Even during these terrible times, he provides a way out. It's in his very nature. In fact, we see there in verse 6, we see it says, then John says, then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had, and I underline this in my Bible, you should do the same, he had the eternal gospel, which if you look at the title of the message today, I've summed it up to say this, the never-ending good news. 
he had the never-ending good news. It's the eternal gospel. It's good news that never ends. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. By the way, I think this is the only time in Scripture that we see the job of proclaiming the gospel message now left to an angel. Up to this point, it's our job to proclaim the gospel. We have been given a charge to go out into all the world and make disciples, to preach the good news of Jesus. That's our job. During this time of great tribulation, God in his great mercy is going to send another messenger, an angel down, to proclaim the gospel message to, as John describes here, to every nation, every tribe, every language, and every people. The never-ending good news. You know, when I settled on the title for the message, I thought, you know what, that title sounds a lot like a movie that I saw when I was a kid, The Never-Ending Story. Have you guys ever heard that, that movie, The Never-Ending Story? So I decided, you know, as part of my sermon prep, I needed to watch the movie, The, the Never-Ending Story. And so, so I did. So I went home, and I found it on Amazon, and I read it, and I, I watched it. And it had been so long since I'd seen it. It's so cheesy, by the way. I mean, the, the graphics in this movie are absolutely horrible compared to what we see now. And, um, but there's a few characters in there. There's a, there's a dog, a uh, dragon. He, he is what they call the, the good luck dragon. And his name is Falcor. And then there's Ardiu, or, or, or sorry, Atreyu, that's how they say his name, Atreyu in the film, he's the main character in, in Fantasia, in this fantasy world. And then there's Bastion, who's the kid, he's the main character overall. Then there's the Empress, this, this uh, princess, this girl that they're trying to save. And the story is all about a young boy whose mother had died and who finds himself wrestling with childhood depression. That's the story of the never-ending story. And, and in the story, there's a statement that's made that I thought was pretty profound in the movie. And it's made by a character, and I can't remember who the character was now, but, but the statement was this, that, that, the, that people who are without hope are easily controlled. And I thought to myself, well, that's a pretty powerful statement. People who are without hope are easily controlled. I thought, well, that plays really well into where we find ourselves in our world today. There are a lot of people who are wandering around without hope. And they're grasping at straws, looking for places to find that hope. And the never-ending story is about a place, it's about the imagination of a child, that, that if you engage in that imaginative world and you exercise that imagination, that the story can continue forever. It's the never-ending story. It's a wonderful thought as you think about that of a child. But also, as I thought about this, I thought it's the same truth that we're reading here in the eternal gospel, the never-ending good news. Even in the last moments, God is throwing out a lifeline. He's saying to the world, there is hope. There is still hope. All you have to do is turn to me. Put your faith and trust in me. When I was a teenager, about 16 years old, I was... Um, uh, I had several friends. I, we lived out in Texas and, and uh, in the Fort Worth area, little suburbs outside of Fort Worth, these cow towns. And one of my friends, Jeremiah, he was a year older than me. He was, um, he was a senior. I was a junior. And uh, we were on our way to our youth pastor's house because he was planning a get-together for all the guys in the youth group, and we were going to go and hang out. And we jumped into Jeremiah's car, or I did. He came by and picked me up, and he drove this giant station wagon, and it was one of those uh, wood-paneled station wagons, you know. And so we, we were driving down the road, and like teenage boys, we were, we were driving too fast. He was driving. I was a passenger. And uh, in these back Texas country roads, okay, and, uh, and in Texas in these back roads, and I've been there in the last several years. I've been back, and it's still the same. The roads have these ditches on the sides, both sides of the road, because it rains a lot there in, in East Texas. And they put the ditches, they build the roads that way so the water can collect in those ditches, and it's just kind of a runoff. And So anyways, all the roads are that way in the back country of Texas. And so we're driving through these, these uh, you know, dirt, gravel, paved, sometimes paved roads, and going way too fast. And Jeremiah takes a turn way too fast, and, 
that station wagon just goes right off the road and into the ditch. And we hit that ditch, and it, the, the car just stopped dead. Now, Jeremiah was a cowboy. He wore a cowboy hat everywhere he went. And he also had glasses on his, that he wore. And when we hit that ditch, we both blacked out. I think it knocked us both out. And when I came to, I came to before Jeremiah, and I came to, and, I, and I'm trying to gather myself, and I look over at Jeremiah, and he's just passed out in the driver's seat. And I look at him, and his hat's gone, his glasses are gone, and I'm still trying to gather my senses. What happened here? Where are we at? And, uh, and I turn to him, and I say his name, Jeremiah, and I, I shook him a little, and he starts to come to. And then he, he kind of comes to and wakes up. And then we, we figure out that we can't get out of the doors of the station wagon. So we crawl out the back. We had to crawl all the way out the back and through the back door. It was the only way we could get out of this thing. And he's now afraid. You know, my parents are going to kill me. You know how that goes, right? You're like, this is it. It's the end of my life. My parents are going to kill me and whatever. And he doesn't have his glasses. We're looking all over for his glasses. For his, We found his hat. It was easy to spot. But his glasses we couldn't find. And Finally, we found them sort of tucked in the wheel well in the back of the station wagon. The, the whiplash just must have thrown his glasses all the way to the back windshield of the car. So we found his glasses, and we found a guy. Everybody in Texas is pretty friendly, at least most people are. We found a guy, a neighbor, and he comes out. He heard the crash, and he says, hey, hey you guys all right? We said, yeah, yeah, we're, we're okay, we're okay. Could you help us get this car out of the ditch? So he pulls out his old farm truck, hooks up the car, and begins to try to pull this station wagon out of the ditch, right? Well, he hooked the car, the, his chain, up to the, the rear frame. There was a, you know, a hole in the frame in the back, like a tow point. And he, he begins to try to pull the station wagon out, and that thing is not moving. I mean, it was like a tank. It was wedged in that ditch. I mean, the back end was off the ground. And anyways, he's pulling and pulling and pulling, and then all of a sudden rips a piece of the frame of the car out. And it's like, well, this is bad news. <laughs> I mean, it got, went from bad to worse, you know. And, I mean, in our minds, this thing's still drivable. But now at this point, we're like, yeah, I don't think this thing's still drivable. And so uh, he says, look, guys, I, I can't get this thing out. I'm not going to be able to help you. So Jeremiah and I said, that's okay. We'll, we'll go get some help. You know, this is before cell phones. We didn't have any of that. So we decided we'd walk to our youth pastor's house. So we did. We were about, you know, maybe a couple miles still away. And so we walked to his house, and we told him what happened, and he says, let, let me go try to get it out. And he had this old Jeep, this little Jeep Wrangler, and so we were like, I don't think that's going to work. And he says, no, 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 it'll work, trust me. So he gets the Jeep out there, hooks it up, and that Jeep, I'm not kidding you, I wish we had a video feed of this, because that Jeep looked like a marlin on the end of a fishing line, okay? It was like, like this all over the road. And that station wagon is kind of shimmering and moving, and he's just not giving up, and he's just going all over. And then all of a sudden, it starts to creep out of the ditch. And he gets it out of that ditch, and I was shocked. I'm just watching this with my jaw drop. Well, we get it out of the ditch, and we quickly realize this thing is not going to run. There is no way. It is total. But um, we were okay. We, we, we woke up the next day. I woke up the next day, and I had a bruise that was the shape of a seatbelt right across my chest, just all the way across. And, uh, and we, were, we were sore for a little while after that accident, but we both were okay. We walked away, and God provided a way for us to get the station wagon out of the ditch. Now, Jeremiah, he didn't provide a way for Jeremiah to get out of trouble. Um, so, so Jeremiah lost his driver's license. Uh, not because of the police. There was no police report filed, but his parents took it away, which is probably worse. And so he didn't drive again until at least he was 18. I moved back. I moved to California before Jeremiah got his license back. But there was a way out for us. You know, Chuck Smith said this as he was sort of reminiscing on this passage, on this idea of the eternal gospel. He says, I find it interesting that this far into the Great Tribulation, God is still sending his messengers to proclaim the gospel. What an incredible thing. And when they come, they're going to they proclaim the gospel message to the whole world. Listen, I, I wrestled with this a little bit this week, because those of you who have been in church for a while, you, you, you may have bought into this, as I have, that the church has a mission and a charge to proclaim the gospel message to the whole world, and then it opens up the door, the opportunity, for the rapture to happen, the church to be taken up, and the end will come. 
Where, where do we get that idea? We get that idea from Matthew 24, verse 14. Let me, let me read this verse with you. It says this in Matthew 24, 14. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Well, when I read Revelation 14, 6, I see being described here an event where the gospel message is very vividly described as being preached to the whole world, every nation, every tribe, and every language. And it's being preached to the whole world by an angel, a messenger from God. And so, yes, the gospel message is going to be preached to the whole world. Yes, we have been given a charge to go into all of the world and make disciples. But listen, I, I've been wrestling with this thought. Is it, is it our responsibility? Or in other words, let me word it this way. Is God waiting for his return for the church to preach the gospel message to the whole world? Well, this verse in Revelation seems to contradict that thought. Yes, Jesus could return at any point. Are there unreached peoples in the world? Yes, I think there still are people who haven't heard the gospel. But there is coming a day where there will be no excuse, where God will send a, an angelic messenger who will proclaim this good news in every language, in every tribe, in every nation. People will be left without excuse. You know, one of the founding fathers of our nation, Benjamin Franklin, he, uh, he was a comedian at times and, and had some jokes, and he decided one day that he was going to pen his own epitaph, okay? What would be written on his tombstone, right? So here's what he wrote. He says this. He says, the body of B. Franklin Printer. Like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and strips of its lettering, well, and stripped of its lettering and gilding. Lies here food for worms. But the work shall not be wholly lost, for it will be, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more perfect edition, corrected and amended by the author. Well, what a powerful picture. Yes, this book, this old body, this old life of ours is worn out, pages torn. It will be sent to the dirt where the worms will eat it. But there is something after the grave, by the way. There is life after death. Every person is going to experience that. And so there is hope. There is a heaven. Heaven is a real place. It is not some made-up fairy tale fantasy land. Heaven is a real place. It's not like in the never-ending story, just a part or a figment of your imagination. It is a real place. And John says there in verse 7, as he's talking about this angel, he says, he says, he said in a loud voice, this is his command, by the way, to the whole world. Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And here's that word again. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Someone once said this. I thought this was a great quote. They said, you can give glory to God and worship him willingly in this life, or you will be compelled to give glory to him later. I don't know if you remember last week I, I made this statement. That our lives right now, the events, the experiences that we have, are in a sense the forming of the choruses and the verses for a song that we will sing for all of eternity. We are experiencing right now the presence and power of God in our lives, and we are writing the songs that we will sing for all of eternity. We're going to be writing those messages about grace, about mercy, about God's intervention in our lives. All of these things are taking place in our lives right now so that we will have a song to sing in eternity. And you can give glory to God and worship him willingly right now in this life, or you will be compelled to give glory to him later. Heaven is a real place. The Bible tells us that there's coming a day where every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and that every, uh, that every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Heaven is a real place. We're going to find ourselves there. I want to read you just a little excerpt. I came across this years ago. I use this often when I'm hosting or holding a memorial service. This was written back, oh, probably about 30 or 40 years ago by a theologian and preacher by the name of um, J.I. Packer. Uh, and he says this. He says, we know very little about heaven. He says, but I once heard a theologian describe it as an unknown region with a well-known inhabitant. 
And there's not a better way to think of it than that. He says, I get older, I find that I appreciate God and people and good and lovely things uh, more and more intensely. So it is pure delight to think that this enjoyment will continue and increase in some form. What form? God knows, and I am content to wait and see. Literally forever. Heaven is an eternal place. Just like we read, hell is an eternal place. In fact, Christians inherit the destiny which fairy tales imagined and fancy. He says, we, yes, you and I, the silly saved sinners, live and live happily, and by God's endless mercy, we will live happily ever after. We cannot visualize heaven's life. He says, the wise man will not try to do so. Instead, we will dwell on the doctrines of heaven, where the redeemed will find all of their heart's desire. Joy with their Lord, joy with his people, and joy in the ending of all frustration and distress and in the supply um, and distress and in the supply of all wants. He says, what was said of the child, if you want sweets and hamsters in heaven, they'll be there. That was not an evasion, but a witness to the truth that in heaven, no felt needs or longings go unsatisfied. What our wants will actually be, however, he says, we hardly know, except the first and foremost, we shall always want to be with the Lord. And what shall we do in heaven? Are we going to lounge around playing harps and, and looking like, uh, you know, um, angels in white robes and, uh, and sitting on clouds? No. We're going to be worshiping. We're going to be working. We're going to be thinking. We're going to be communicating, enjoying activity, beauty, people, and God. And first and foremost, however, we will see. We're going to love Jesus. We'll see him in his fullness, our Savior, our Master, and our friend. Listen, heaven is a real place. Just like hell is an eternal real place, so is heaven. And we all have an opportunity to go there. C.S. Lewis said this about hell. He says, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. There are many people who have been fooled into thinking that they are living their lives right or that they have some opportunity to be in heaven. Things are not always as they seem, by the way. Look at what this second angel says. I find this interesting. The second angel followed and said this, fallen, fallen is Babylon the what? Why in the world would he describe Babylon as great? It's almost an oxymoron especially coming from an angel of God. Why would an angel of God describe this system of government, these people who are steeped in fornication? Why would he describe it as great? He says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. By the way, these adulteries are not just physical adulteries or sexual immorality. These are spiritual adulteries. These are a rejection of God, a worship of pagan gods, of other gods with a small g. I think he called Babylon the Great for a couple reasons. One, I think because in some ways it was great. And in a future sense, as this is prophetic, it will be great. But what do you mean by that, Chris? What what do you mean it'll be great? I mean, they're going to be victims of God's judgment and wrath. Well, listen, have you ever stood at the base of a skyscraper and looked up? It is awe-inspiring. That was made by human hands. Have you ever been on a cruise ship out in the ocean, on a massive ship, a floating city, if you will, made by human hands? Humanity has sent spaceships into space, landed people on the moon. We can fly in an airplane or in a jet plane around the world. We have computers and smartphones and the internet, all of this technology at our disposal. And so you might be able to look at the things that humanity has created and say, oh yes, this is great. And yes, it is great. There are some things that are really great. But humanity hasn't just achieved amazing things in a good way. Humanity has achieved amazing things also in some terrible ways. I mean, think about the nuclear bomb, for example, or the various weapons of mass destruction that humanity has created, the weapons of war. Think about the millions and millions and millions of unborn children that are killed every day in America, okay, in the name of bodily autonomy. Humanity has done a lot of things, 
that are amazingly terrible. Think about the, the, the influence and, and the rise of pornography in the world. In fact, I saw something recently that said there is a, a website, a pornographic website that has far more visitors than any other website, news organization, video place of anything in the world by tens and tens of millions of clicks a day. And guess where all of that is centered? Right here in the United States of America. And so pornographic and sexual immorality is risen to a level that we have never seen in human history. And everyone has access to it in a moment. Yes, Babylon is great for some amazing things, but for also some amazingly terrible things. You know, there was a, a tower that was built in the Old Testament. We call it the, the Tower of Babel. Why is it called the Tower of Babel? Well, because it was the first, really, of the great cities, if you will, of Babylon. And so Babylon is not just an ancient city that existed in the past. It's a representation of all cities, of all systems of humanity who rises to power in opposition to God. And so Babylon in Scripture is used as a symbol of pagan worship. We see Babylon making the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries here, as John describes it. And as a result of their spiritual and physical adultery, we see God making them drink the wine of his judgment. And so the reality is, is yes, Babylon is great. But Babylon is going to be judged for all of its immorality. And the earth is going to be judged. You know, Jesus taught his followers to pray a, a specific prayer, and I, I find it profound, especially in the times that we are living in. He told them that they should pray to, we should pray to our Father in heaven. He says, holy is your name, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so God taught us to pray that his kingdom would come to earth and that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. This, by the way, sums up the purpose of the human race. Those who have been created, by the way, in the image of God. Are you a human being? You've been created in the image of God. God has a calling on your life to pray, to seek, to live out, if you will, his kingdom here on earth. So many people and so many churches and pastors today in our world are saying, we can't get involved in the muck and the mess of the world. We're just going to keep ourselves separate from that. Listen, that is not the intent of what God called us as believers to do. He called us as believers to pray and to actively seek to bring about God's kingdom on earth. We are created in the image of God, you guys. He is the creator of all things. We cannot forget that. We can't set that aside and say, oh, government is here and we are here. It doesn't work that way. We are living our lives on the earth. God has called us to live our lives pleasing before him. He has called us to pray and to seek that his will would be done, that his kingdom would come here on the earth. We should be seeking God's will and his way for our lives and for our world, not man's ways. Our ways, man's ways, the Bible says, leads to death and destruction. You know that famous verse, there is a way that seems right to a man but in the end, it leads to death. I want to end with these thoughts. Yes, we live in some challenging times. Yes, we see a system of, of, of anti-God, of pagan worship, of, of the worship of creation, of humanity, of, of knowledge, of all of these things. We're witnessing all of that before us. And sin seems to be rising at a level that we've not seen maybe ever. But the truth is, the eternal gospel has this, that God can save you from the power of sin in your life. Sin may have a stronghold in your life, but God can save you from the power of sin in your life. And sin, the Bible tells us, is destructive in nature. It's like a disease. It gets into us and it ruins us. It destroys us from the inside out. And sin is in the process, by the way, of destroying you right now. In fact, people look at the creation of the world and they say, what went wrong? I mean, God created it perfect, right? Well, what went wrong was that sin entered into the world. And sin is in the process right now of destroying you. 
Paul tells us this in Romans. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And so because of sin and the presence of sin in our lives, we have earned, we have deserved, we, have, we are being paid out, if you will, in death. James said that sin, when it is finished, it brings death. What do you mean finished? Well, sin is trying to work its way out through your life and to kill you. He says there in James, he says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Sin, when it is finished, it brings death. That all sounds terrible, you say, Chris. Well, this is not eternally never-ending good news. <laughs> Where's the good news in all of that? Well, here it is. The good news, this eternal gospel, is that through Jesus, you can be saved from the penalty of sin. Through Jesus, you can be saved from the power of sin in your lives. Some of you are like, man, I just feel like I can't get away from this. It's got a hold on me. Well, the good news is that God can save you. Jesus can save you from the power of sin in your life. And that one day, this is the eternal hope that we live with, one day we will be saved from the presence of sin in our lives. We will be entering into a heaven, into a world that is absent of all of these terrible things. And by the way, it doesn't get any better than that. That is incredible. The story is told about a young girl named Christina longing to leave her poor Brazilian neighborhood. She wanted to see the world. She was discontent with a home having only a pallet on the floor, a wash basin, and a wood-burning stove. She dreamed of a better life in the city, and one morning she slipped away, breaking her mother's heart, and knowing what life on the streets would be like for her young, attractive daughter, Maria, her mother, hurriedly packed to go and find her. And on her way to the bus stop, she entered a drugstore to get one last thing, pictures. She sat in the photo booth, closed the curtain, and spent all the money she had on pictures of herself. With her purse full of, a, of small black and white photos, she boarded the next bus to Rio de Janeiro. Maria knew Chris, Christina had no way of earning money. She also knew that her daughter was too stubborn to give up. You see, when pride meets hunger, a human will do things that were before unthinkable. Knowing this, Maria began her search. She went to as many bars, hotels, and nightclubs, any place with a reputation for streetwalkers and prostitutes. She went to them all, and at each place she left her picture. She taped her picture on bathroom mirrors, tacked to hotel bulletin boards, fastened to bus stops. And on the back of each photo, she wrote a little note. And it wasn't too long before the money and the pictures ran out and Maria had to go home. The weary mother wept as the bus began its long journey back to her small village. It was a few weeks later that young Christina descended the hotel stairs. Her young face was tired. Her brown eyes no longer danced with youth, but spoke of pain and fear. Her laughter was broken. Her dream had become a nightmare. A thousand times over, she had longed to trade these countless beds for her secure little pallet. Yet the little village was in too many ways too far away. She looked again, and there on the lobby mirror was a small picture of her mother. Christina's eyes burned and her throat tightened as she walked across the room and she removed the small photo. Written on the back was this compelling invitation. Whatever you have done, whatever you have become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. And she did. Listen, the never-ending good news is that summed up just simply God loves you as you are, and he is providing a way out for you. And you can live with all of the joy and the hope and the peace and the victory that comes from God's kingdom. Yes, there is coming a judgment. 
But God is here and he's standing at the door of your heart today and he's knocking. and He's asking for you to open your heart to him. Let me pray for us. Lord, I want to thank you so much for the never-ending good news, for this eternal gospel that we read about in Scripture. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for saying, no matter what you've done, no matter where you are, no matter what you've become, please come home. Maybe you're here today, and if I were to ask you just plainly, do you know for sure that if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven? Maybe you would say to me, Chris, listen, I'm wrestling with that big time. I, I don't know if I were to die, I would go to heaven. I'm not sure. But I want to know. I want to go to heaven. I want to live that amazing life that you're talking about. I want to be saved and forgiven. Listen, the Bible tells us that there is a way, I said this earlier, that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. But Jesus said in his own words, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so he has created a way, he has made a way for you to get to heaven. All you have to do is simply come to him. You have to accept his gift of forgiveness in your life. Many people have seen crosses like the one behind me, and they wonder what that means. Well, the cross is a symbol of the price, the punishment that Jesus paid for your sins. You see, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so God, in his grace and his mercy and his love, he came down to this world and he gave his life. He paid the way, the wage. He paid the price for your sin. All you have to do is accept his gift of forgiveness in your life. It's like putting on a parachute and jumping out of the plane. You just say, okay, God, I'm placing my life in your hands. I trust you. Thank you for this life-saving gift. And like putting on that parachute, you just put your faith and trust in Jesus. If you're here today and you would say, Chris, that's me. I, I, that's me. I need to give my life to Jesus. I want to invite you to stand up. Just right where you're sitting. Just stand up. This is your chance to say, I'm all in. I'm giving my life to Jesus today. I'm taking that parachute. I'm taking that, that gift. I'm giving my life to him. If that's you, I just want to pray with you. I want to invite you to stand and say, yes, I'm all in. That's me. Listen, if you're listening online, I, I want to encourage you to do the same thing. If you can't stand, if you're in your car, you can just lift your hand. If you can stand, stand. Just say, that's me. I'm all in. I want to give my life to Jesus. And if you're making that decision today, I, I want to lead you just in a simple little prayer. Just a simple prayer that says, God, yes, I'm giving my life to you. So let's pray together. God, I pray for those who are making that decision today. Would you bless them? And if that's you, I just want to lead you in this simple prayer. You don't even have to say it out loud. God knows your thoughts. And so you can just tell him in your heart, in your own words, you can just say, God, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Would you please forgive me? And I want to choose today, Lord, to put my faith and trust in you. And so I'm choosing today, God, to trust you with my life. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Thank you. Thank you for taking my place. Thank you for paying the price. Would you come into my life today to be my Lord and Savior? And I'm turning away from these things in my life. I'm, I'm repenting of these things, and I'm choosing today to follow you. And then take a moment and thank him for saving you. And Lord, I pray for those who have prayed that prayer today. Would you bless them? Thank you for saving them. Thank you for this wonderful gift, this eternally never-ending good news. 
And for all of us, Lord, I pray that you would help us to live in that hope and that faith today. Would, would we go out today and in the coming days this week, Lord, as just light in this world, as salt, Lord, as, as, as dispensers of hope, of joy, of peace, of all the good things that come from you. Thank you, God, for blessing us today. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.